Hello and welcome. It's Wednesday, June 3rd. It is World Bicycle Day. My name is Daniel Hall. I'm the executive director of London Cycle Link. Uh, we are helping more Londoners ride more often and we're excited to have the series to envision a better future, a better normal. And uh, we got a special guest today that we're really keen uh, to bring on and, and pick her brain about all the different ways that um, bikes can be part of the solution. Before we do that, though, uh, we have some announcements, so I'll pass it to my co-host, Luis. Luis, welcome. Thanks, Dan. And like Dan said, today is World Bicycle Day, June 3rd, and I think was established in 2018, so it's a long-standing tradition. Um, but it was established by the United Nations. So if you want to uh, participate, make sure you ride your bike today and post on social media. You can use the, the hashtag World Bicycle Day or World Bicycle Day 2020. There are a few variations on the theme. If you want to know a little bit more about that, you can check their website and, and why um, they consider the bike, um, uh, they give such importance to bike that he even deserves uh, his own world uh, day. And this is the fifth, sixth episode in our webcast. Well, if you're losing track, we do have, um, sorry, we do have all the episodes here on our website, so make sure you check them out. And for other information regarding our uh, emergency response and recovery and how bikes fit into this, um, in the, into this crisis and how it can be part of the solution, we have a few more news and articles in our website as well. Uh, we were going to have a um, virtual town hall to talk about exactly about this green recovery and we're looking forward to that to see what our um, local, provincial, and federal representatives would say about uh, biking uh, when it comes to a green recovery. But I, we just learned that this will be, uh, it was postponed, um, but I think it's still a very relevant conversation. Uh, so if you didn't sign up for that yet, here's the link and um, keep an eye to see when is the new date that is coming up. Then back to you. Thanks, Luis. Um, before I introduce our special guest today, I'd like to acknowledge that not only are we in a pandemic, but we also um, are in a world in North America where uh, the events of Minneapolis and um, just the, the uh, activities that are ongoing, even in our city, even though that maybe there's not the, uh, the same public events that are taking place, we want to acknowledge the efforts in London to um, to, to quell racism, to uh, create a society and a city that everyone has an equal right um, to the city and to opportunities. And we see our role as bike advocates as, as assisting in that. Um, so I just want to acknowledge that before we move on. Um, and uh, to change gears a little bit, although Nancy will have a lot to say about this as well, um, I want to invite our special guest, Nancy Smith-Lee, is the director of the Center for Active Transportation. She's been advocating for and researching about cycling for decades. She's kind of a cycling advocate, rock star, if you will, and we're so excited to have her on. Uh, in 2018, she was featured as one of the eight top chain, women change makers in Toronto, working hard to make the city a better place. And, uh, and we're so excited to, to be able to have her on and share her wisdom and um, experience with us. So thank you for joining us, Nancy. Hey, thanks for having me. And, uh, and thanks so much for that, um, for prefacing um, today with your remarks, uh, Daniel. Um, I also just want to acknowledge um, my privilege in these really tumultuous times to have a safe place to live um, that allows me to shelter in place uh, with access to the outdoors um, in a walkable and bikeable part of, of my city. Um, you know, as a woman and a cyclist, I, I'm vulnerable, um, but the reality is that because of my privilege as a white uh, person, I can do most things that I want to do uh, without thinking twice about my safety. So I think it's it's so important uh, to have that this into the conversation that our public streets and spaces should be, you know, like indiscriminately safe for everyone. So so thank you for prefacing today with with your remarks, Daniel. Well, thank you for that, Nancy. Too, I, I have been reflecting on that and how grateful I am for some of those privileges in, in my life and want to make sure that everyone has that opportunity too. So, so thank you. Um, and we want to start with that why question. You've been, this has been your life's work. Uh, I don't want to maybe um, limit, you probably have lots of life's works uh, in other avenues, but 
you've you've done a lot for cycling and it's your your biography reads like uh i don't know i i am awed by how much you've done and, and worked at and um so i want to just ask the first question is why why have you devoted your life to this why is cycling so important in cities um yeah and thanks for calling it my life's work rather than my obsession which um it's uh kind of is um and it's you know as like a lot of us in this kind of work um we just find ourselves in this in this place kind of accidentally um and and mine is no exception i you know, it was actually a traffic collision that um, that kind of launched me into the world of advocacy. Um, and that was um, over, as you mentioned, over 25 years ago. So um, so the uh, but yeah, it's really hard to kind of underestimate the power of the bicycle. And I know that, that you folks know that and, and probably the people listening as well. I mean, it's such a simple machine, but it's just so um, powerful. And, um, you know, just all of the things about it, it makes us healthy, um, it makes us active, it cleans the air, it's, uh, you know, it's quiet, it's cheap, it's efficient, um, and it's the most practical and convenient way to get around. So those are all like the reasons that, um, ab about it that keep me, um, that have kept me going for the past 25 years. Um, so, so, but, but yeah, there's there's definitely that kind of um, the the social justice aspect to it that has always been very important for me, um, and it's it's really what um, launched me into this um, to this work, um, and it's also to some extent what keeps me going. But one of the things that when I started um, doing the this work in cycling. Um, it was a long time ago, and I was um, a researcher and um, was seeing that there was just no, there was no kind of evidence base around cycling. Um, at the time, there was, I think, the only the only person in North America who was writing about this was John Poocher, who's a, like an amazing rock star um, in the U.S. He's now retired, but um, so that was, a, you know, I wanted to both kind of marry my passion around cycling and with my um, with my research um, focus. And so that's when that's what actually got me started in doing the research part of this. And I did my master's um, on urban cycling safety um, back in, in 2001. So so yeah, so it, I think that that's just the my I mean, there's so much the, the work that that you folks are doing in London and other advocates are doing across the country is so so critically important that kind of um, you know on the ground work, um, but for the most part we do on the ground work as well. We do some community bike hub work, but for the most part our work is really uh, very much has a research um, bent to it. And so, so yeah, I'm happy to talk to you about some of the some of what we've um, found in terms of the um, the impact on the economic impact of cycling. Maybe we'll jump right there then, because uh, we, t we titled this episode Bikeonomics. Um, and just as you say that, one of the things that we on the ground advocates always sort of need is the good data, the good research. So we're ecstatic about the Center for Active Transportation and the work that you do um, to provide some of the tools that we can use to advocate with. Um, so what does the evidence say about bikes and business or bikes and, and the economy? So, um, then in a nutshell, um, I mean, we've been doing, we've been doing this work for, yeah, over a decade. Um, and, um, so what we found in a nutshell is that the, um, where there are main streets in urban centers that, um, that, that there's this contested space around the curb, the curb lane and, um, that, in particular, the on-street parking um, is something that that we found. And when I was doing advocacy work, and I'm sure you come up against it too, is that merchants are very concerned about losing that space uh, to um, for a bike lane. Um, did I did I lose you guys? You there? Sorry, we just we just wanted to give you the whole screen. <laughs> okay. <laughs> But I couldn't see you. <laughs> That's fine. Sure. Um, so so yeah. So um, 
so that space is really contested. And so um, that was something that we wanted to find out was, um, you know, because when in, in public meetings, uh, we would hear from merchants saying, you know, this is going to put us out of business. Um, you know, cyclists don't cyclists don't come to my store. Um, and so we really wanted to find out what was the evidence um, around that. And so, um, so we've been digging into that question um, over the past 10 years or so. Our first report was published in uh, 2009 and then a subsequent one in 2010. And then we did a larger study that was um, released in 2017. And, um, and so in, and in that case, and all of these have been focused on um, Bloor Street in downtown Toronto. Um, but we've done a lot of work to look and to see what else is happening in other cities and, and have done a whole bunch of like some, we have had an amazing research team that have done some great work around on the live review. Um, but basically what we found is that the, um, you know, in terms of like who's coming to those businesses um, in both in downtown Toronto, but even when we did a study looking a little bit further out, the vast majority of people are not driving. And that's that was um, really something that are um, that has was surprising to us at, um, in our first study. It's not as surprising to us anymore. Um, but but I think what we found, and this is consistently been found in the research as well, is that um, is that merchants really overestimate the number of people who are coming to their to their store by um, by car. And um, in the case of, of Bloor Street in the annex, we found that only 10% of people were driving to um, to shop um, or to access services um, on Bloor Street. And so I think that was that was really important. Um, both, you know, each time we've done this study, we found kind of similar response results and have seen that in others as well. And I, but I think that you know that first study that we we put out was really important to kind of address that address that. Um, conception that many people have, um, including merchants, um, that that most people are driving to their store, and so um, so that was um, that was a really important finding. And and um, the so the other thing that we were were interested in was, you know, how did what was what would that look like in terms of the um, you know if we if we made that change to the street environment in terms of putting in a bike lane. Um, what would the result be? And so in, as I mentioned, our last study, we finally had the opportunity um, to um, to do a case control pre-post study because there was a, a pilot bike lane being proposed for Bloor Street. And so we went in and, and collected data before, and then we collected um, data at two other um, points um, after the bike lane was put in to, to find out if, if people's travel patterns had changed the city did a whole host of of, um, of studies as well around safety and around um, collisions and all sorts of things. So, but ours was really focused on the on the economic impact. And um, so, so yeah, we used um, we 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 uh, surveyed both. Uh, we surveyed over three thousand people on the street, and we surveyed all of the um, the ground level um, merchants. Um, and we also used a control site um, in another part of town to kind of get a, a sense of how things were were different in the two areas. And it was um, so. And so what we found was that that people who are who are walking and cycling and taking transit are coming more often, and they're spending more money than people who are driving in that location. Um, and so that was a really important finding. We also found that the vacancy rates um, remained pretty stable. Um, and the city also did a, a study looking at um, the, uh, the Monera's um, uh, credit card transaction data um, and found that the, um, the transactions were fairly similar if you compare them to the, to the other parts of the, the city. So, so yeah, I think those are the, the, the main things that we found in the study, which was obviously pre-pandemic. Um, and the um, so it's it's hard to know, you know what what this is going to look like post pandemic. But I think it's been it's been pretty clear to us that the the role of people walking and cycling to these local businesses is really 
it's it's it can't be overstated um, that you know that's people like to live in in walkable, cyclable places. They they want to hang out there and they want to shop there, um, and so. Um, so obviously this isn't like about um, um, big box locations or suburban locations. This is really about those kind of like what main streets. Um, um, so, and in our case, it was focused on Bloor Street, but there's been a lot of other studies, um, mostly in the US um, that have found really similar kind of results. One of the pushbacks that we got when we were advocating for um, you know, using this research and saying, look, like bikes are good for business, good for merchants, because here's the evidence in Toronto, here's the evidence in New York City and Portland. One of the pushbacks we got was, oh, that's, you know, those are big cities with a developed biking culture. What about mid-sized cities? Um, do you have any yeah. comments on that? Yeah, so I wanted to get my notes on that because I actually reached out to, we had in our, in our, um, uh, the, um, the, we had a paper that was published in the Journal of American Planning, um, JAPA, and um, the, our main, our uh, primary um, author on that paper, Daniel Aaron Sibia, um, did a lot of work on the Lit Review. Um, so it was, uh, when I knew that this was a question that um, you obviously interested in, I, um, I, I reached out to him to see what he, what he had found. And it was interesting, he said that, um, so the North American research on this topic is focused on larger cities, as you know, um, although Portland and Seattle are arguably not um, super large cities, not certainly not by global standards, um, but um, because they're the places where there's the most competition for that curb space that I was talking about. Um, and he said they're the, and they're also the places that are most unlike Dutch cities, which tend to be on the smaller side and where we know cycling infrastructure works really well. So I think that was part of the, I think that's part of the reason that this research is being done in, re, in large cities in North America. We already, some of the pushback that we get in terms of wanting to have this kind of infrastructure in a large city like Toronto is, well, we're not a small city. Like this is a big city, you, like we don't have, we can't be like messing around with, with bikes and we need to be moving tra traffic. Right. So, um, so I think that's, we definitely have a lot of evidence from the, from Dutch cities and from Northern European cities about how well um, bike infrastructure works in terms of the, that connection with the, with the economy. Um, and, and one of the studies that, um, that we looked at though, um, was um, in, um, it was uh, in Davis, California, and they actually did a study that looked at the, um, the impact of big box on the the other um, local local businesses, and they found that the businesses that were kind of, were on that main street were much less affected by than by the big box than other than other streets, and that was that was um, those kind of main streets are are more walkable and cyclable places. So I think there's lots of there's lots of reasons. You know, I think we, there's a lot that we can point to in terms of this being um, uh, really working for for small cities. We've also done at TCAT, we've done a bunch of um, um, kind of best practice um, work where we've looked at, uh, we've put a, released a couple of publications. One, um, the Active Transportation Beyond the Green Belt, um, so that looks at rural and smaller communities. Um, and we've also released a a publication called Complete Street Transformations, where we're looking at um, a whole bunch of um, a whole bunch of communities and street projects in these different communities that of, of varying sizes. Um, for the most part, those have not looked at economic impact. Um, there's um, the um, for most smaller municipalities, there's typically not the budget to kind of do that this kind of work on the economic impact. Um, but definitely what we, we have seen, like there's these, there's a number of, of goals that, that uh, municipalities have in developing complete streets. Um, so, you know, one, we hope that there will be more people walking and cycling. Secondly, we hope that it's going to be safer, that we'll see, you know, fewer, um, 
fewer collisions um, that are that are severe and have um, um, fatalities and serious injuries. Um, and then there's you know these there's these other kind of hopes that we have that are really hard to measure that are about that larger Im impact like the better air quality and um, better public health outcomes, um, reduced obesity, um, and um, improved regional environment. So there's a lot of goals that municipalities have um, in in building complete streets that are that we found are really um, they're really difficult to measure. The work that we've done around this, it's expensive for most um, for most small municipalities. Um, so I think that's one of the reasons that it's you know it's it's not being measured um, in the extent that it is. But I think we've from what we've found, we're pretty confident that it's this um, that um, that bike lanes are are for no matter what size of of city. Um, so and I think I'll just and I, oh, sorry. I was just going to uh, end by saying on that 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 the the other. Um, the other thing about smaller cities is that there's typically more space to um, to build bike infrastructure without impacting the traffic environment if that is your desire to do so. Right. So um, some of that some of that that those issues around the competing space um, don't just aren't as much of an issue in the smaller municipalities. Yeah. So. Um I want to ask you, and based on your experience, and you, you've been involved in this for, for decades, and as you said, it's kind of an obsession. So I want to ask for your uh, dreamer hat or your imagination hat more than your researcher hat. Okay. Because, like you said, we don't have um, uncertainty is actually the normal, right? We just thought that we could predict and plan things. Um, mm -hmm. And we could, you know, like 2020, we'll do this, 2021 would be like that. And and COVID came and just showed us. And again, it's not that sh uh, COVID created this whole new situation. It just exposed a lot of what is already out there. Um, mm -hmm. But we're all, we're living in uncertainty as much as we were before. So mm -hmm. um, using that based on your experience and the things that, um, the research that you, you did and the projects involved in Toronto, and, and now with this new reality with physical distancing and some of the initiatives that we see uh, in Canada, in, in the States and throughout the world. And we're trying to, talking about economics, trying to uh, recover local businesses and then create more space for them, more public space so they can have, they can have their clients, they can offer their services and products, but they can still offer the physical distancing how do you see uh, the the role of cycling and walking, so active transportation in, in general, uh, in the best case scenario moving forward? Um, how how does this play out? Um, we have the Bloor bike lane as kind of a, uh, mm -hmm. a reference for so many other bike lane projects that we have in Canada and in North America. So if we could have more of those how do you see uh, that scenario in our, um, I guess we could say our new normal with the physical distance yeah. measures? Yeah, um, I mean, I think the, um, I think the, the hope is that the, um, you know, it's, it's really like, it's, it's very upsetting that it's taken a pandemic for municipalities to recognize that, that, People walking and cycling don't have the space they need to get around, um, and so that's. Um, I mean, I think that we. I mean, now obviously it's it, there's this other layer of of needing to have this this physical distance between people, but that but there's also the just that issue that there just there is there hasn't been enough space, and we've given over too much of that space to motor vehicles, um, private motor, motor vehicles for the most part. So I think that you know the kind of hope is that that's that. That municipalities will will recognize that that's this is this was the moment where we realize that and we're going to um, this this will be the new normal as you say um, but I think kind of beyond that I think it's um, the I mean I, I see people all the time um, who in 
you know, in Toronto who are like walking in the middle of the street, um, mostly on residential streets. But, um, and I think that, that, that like the just the kind of general citizens have also recognized that this is, you know what, like we've just been giving over all of this space that we need um, and we're taking it because we need it. And so I'm hoping that that will also just kind of on that individual level that people will still um, feel that, you know, that that's, this is theirs to take and that, um, that this is um, the right thing to do is, is to provide um, more space for people. Um, so, so yeah, I don't know if that, did you have another part to that question that I didn't answer? No, I think it was, it was pretty much that okay. like the, the role of cycling and um, you start mentioning the maybe post uh, physical distancing um, yeah. scenario. And um, I don't know if you wanna um, say something else about that. Like how do you see cycling as part of this uh, economic recovery? And I guess I can say green economic recovery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think it's, you know, for the, for the, um, for the same reasons that we, that we, that we know it's that it's important to have this space like um when we we're not in a pandemic i think that's that is it's the same from before the pandemic it will be the same after that we just need to be giving more space and that the more the more that we can make our environments walkable and cyclable the more that that will benefit our local economy so i mean i think that that's um those those things will remain true I think one of the things that we've, I mean, and we've been trying to track what, what municipalities are doing across the country. And we've seen like, you know, upwards of 30, 35 municipalities who are now doing some kind of reallocation of, of public space um, to, to give people walking and cycling more space, which is great. Most, for the most part, they're not talking about that being permanent, although um, kind of hope that it, that it will be. Um, and certainly, I don't see us coming out of this anytime soon. And so it, it, I think that we're going to need to have these temporary measures in place for a while. Um, but one of the things that I guess kind of has concerned me and that's related to the, to the, the business recovery is the, um, is the, um, this idea of, of extending the patios into the public space, which some municipalities are doing, which is, a really, it's a great idea to, I mean, we're all for like helping local businesses and getting them open. Like we, you know, that's, that's super important, but I think we just need to make sure we're, we're applying um, an equity lens and an anti-racist lens to that work and making sure that we're, you know, that as we've seen, you know, with, in, um, it's been really highlighted this past week uh, that our streets are not safe especially for people of color. Um, they're not safe for people walking and cycling, but they're also not safe for people of color. And so we need to make sure that when we're, that even though we want people, we want municipalities to move quickly, um, we also want to make sure that we're applying a, a, an equity lens to that work and, and ensuring that we're not carving off more of our public space for private use. Um, if there's not also a sufficient space for people to move um, comfortably and just hang out comfortably without buying anything if that's what they need they want to do um, so I think all of those those um, I just think that that needs to be included in this conversation around how we're helping our local businesses get get back um, back up and running um, and and I think it's also another reason that we need to also be a bit cautious about some of this, this, these temporary measures that we're putting in place because we haven't had a sufficient public consultation. And that's always really important for understanding the lived experience of people who are, you know, in the, in the spaces that we're designing. So I think that that's, um, that's important to be considering as well, that we put something in place now, let's think about it as a pilot, let's assess it, see what works, talk to the people who are, who are most affected and, and, you know, kind of adjust as we need to. Great. Thanks. Um, I know one of the things that we often reflect on is that uh, 
there's a there's a quote that says women are the indicator species of, of like good infrastructure for cycling. Um, you look at Europe and where there's developed cycling infrastructure, and I think there's more women riding than men. And then in our cities in North America, often it's it's um, I don't know 75 percent men, or or maybe maybe the the gap is less so in in cities that have more developed infrastructure. Um, but taking an equity lens, what, what's your advice for cycling advocates um, to frame the conversation to advocate for the right things that will serve everyone and will give public space that is open for, for everyone? Do you have any tips or advice for, for us as advocates or even maybe for our, our decision makers as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, um, the, the gender um, issue is really an interesting one. And yeah, it's true that it's like something like 70, 30 um, um, in terms of cycling, um, who's cycling in our, in Canada, um, it's even less, the, the numbers are a bit starker in some places. Um, so, and I, and, you know, we've I've kind of, I've looked into that issue a lot and so have other researchers and um, it's, so what I've kind of come to at the end of the day is that um, if we're, there's, there's nothing in particularly unusual about women that we need to think about, you know, it's like sometimes there's like, oh, well maybe we should have, you know, like special programs or, and, and those are good. It's just that, you know, there's, uh, I think what we've found is that women typically have more barriers to cycling than, than men. Um, they tend to trip chain more than, than men. So they tend to take, you know, they'll take the kids to school and they'll do the shopping and they'll do whatever. So there's all these reasons that, that women have more barriers in front of them to take up cycling. And I think from my perspective, it's like, it's, it's um, like the infrastructure is like a no brainer. Like that's the making um, our streets safe um, is just gonna make more, is gonna, result in more people cycling and the more people are cycling the more women will cycle and that's there's just this kind of nice virtuous cycle to that um but but the um uh you know, sorry i lost my train of thought there what was i saying remind me this is about equ <laughs> equity lens and you're talking about um women i mean you're using the, the women don't have to be designed for specifically necessarily okay. like it yeah yeah, so it's like addressing the, the barriers that, that women have and that many people have, like many people have those barriers. Um, um, so it's it's around safety. Safety is always like the number one. Um, but there's other there's other um, barriers as well. Um, you know, even like if you look at like who's um, the the kind of uh, cultural um, aspect of cycling that um, that there's this, um, you know, the kind of racing culture, there's the light, um, like culture. Um, and some of those, those, that, those cultural elements can be, uh, feel a bit exclusionary for, um, for women in particular. So I think, so creating this kind of, of like, um, more open, um, environments in, in all of our institutions and all the work that we're doing, um, is really, is, is really important. Cool. Thank you. Um, one thing you mentioned earlier was about your work in uh, away from the core of Toronto and like in Scarborough and, and some of the bike hubs there. Um, sometimes I feel like London has a bit of the sort of tale of two cities too. There's kind of the urban and suburban components to it. What um, what has been successful that in in Scarborough that has allowed uh, people there to engage with the cycling culture and just start riding more in general? I guess. Mm hmm. Yeah. Um, so we've, yeah, we've now been, it's, it's, we're now working on our third project in the, in suburban communities. We're working in Markham now. Um, and when we first started doing this work in, in Scarborough, um, my, the team that kind of came to me on it, who had the idea where like, we really think this is important to, to not just be focusing on the downtown, we need to figure out how to like how to increase cycling outside of the core. And I was I came at this thinking, I just I don't see it. Like I really couldn't. I didn't have the imagination to see that we that there was a need that that I knew there was a need, but I didn't think there was a demand. Um, 
And so that's been really very instructive for me in particular, because to, you know, once you actually just focus on, you know, we, we did some research to see where there was the most likely um, possibility of people wanting to cycle, where there were destinations close together, where there was already maybe a bit of infrastructure, like where they, we had the most, um, the, the most chance of actually influencing um, change. And I think that's where we, what we need to think about, like cycling is so local, it's so local, it's so hyper local. And so I think the, all the work that we're doing, like just thinking about, we don't have to think about suburban urban divides. Like it's, it's like, look at your, that where you want to impact and like work in that context and work with the advocates in that area. And, and we've been so, I've been so amazed by the response that we've had. Like, it's just like people have been like, okay, so where were you before? Like this, we've been, you know, waiting for someone to pay attention to us. Like there was one bike shop in Scarborough. I think there still is like, you know, so it's, it's just the, this, these kind of neglected areas um, that, but also where there's this high potential for influencing uh, change. Um, so, yeah, I think it's like, it's, so I think I, you know, it's, it's been a real learning curve for me because I think that there's this kind of idea of suburbs as being monolithic and uniform and they're really not like there's, there's, um, they definitely as a whole are more car dependent than the urban areas. But there's pockets where, you know, we there's lots of trips are being made that are under five kilometers, that there's where there's some, you know, good alternate like routes that you can just, you know, help people to kind of see where those routes are and, and give them some, some support and, you know, help them with their, their bike repair. And just like those things can really go a long way to actually um, making some change in those areas. And without that, you don't get the demand for the infrastructure you don't get you know so that's this kind of like this um you know both things are happening that if you don't you know if you don't get that demand the counselors are like well i'm not hearing about it from my constituents so you really need to get in there and, and make sure that people um feel supported and see this as a viable option and and so yeah um yeah no i think answer your question <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. No, I think we've we've faced that in London that that we were advocating primarily, and we realized, you know, they they kept pointing to like, well, where's the demand? And so we said we have to get into the work of creating culture and creating new riders. Um, and so we mm -hmm. got involved in a in a do-it-yourself bike shop similar to the, the Scarborough um, bike hub there to to do that work to create a community hub and and try and foster more cyclists and uh, more demand ultimately for, for infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. it's both, it's both advocacy and uh, community building, I think, which, mm -hmm. which is what you've, you've acknowledged. Mm -hmm. um, so we're- Yeah, I think- we're, uh, oh. I'm sorry. No, go for it. I was just gonna say that I think that the other piece of that is that I think we also, especially in a, in, um, a center like Toronto where there's a lot of advocacy and there's a lot of bike shops and a lot of DIY and there's a lot of like kind of cultural stuff happening there. We underestimate the importance of that um, and think it's all just about the infrastructure and the infrastructure is super critical, but there was a lot of advocacy that was happening here in Toronto before we had any infrastructure at all. So I think it's, it's the, all of those supports um, and that cult, including the cultural supports are really important for, for building, building up demand. Cool. Well, that's affirming. Thank you. Um, we want to sort of wrap up our time with uh, with our vision question, and I kind of Louise touched mm -hmm. on it a little bit earlier, but um, you've been a advocate and and a researcher and thinking about the bikes for 25 years. Um, if you could, you know, you were given the the, the keys to the city and, and make your make your changes that you wanted to see implemented. Um, if you could describe that future for us, just to, to mm -hmm. share with us um, what it looks like and and who's who's there and who's involved. That'd be mm -hmm. great. Um, so I guess it, they, yeah, I mean, I think every, you know, every Canadian city and community, um, you know, that our public spaces are safe and welcoming for everyone, no matter how you get around, um, no matter, you know, if you're able or disabled, if, you know, um, and so, and if you're, you know, the color of your skin, obviously like that's like, I think all of these things are, you know, just that that's the kind of 
minimum that we that I'm that I can I'm hoping for, um, and that the that our communities are prioritizing walking and cycling, um, that we continue to like um, to uh, take some of that space that we've allowed to be dominated by cars, um, and to make it um, better um, have better uses. Um, I think also in my um, kind of ideal world, like it's the transportation and housing are so linked and the um, having affordable housing, having no homelessness. Um, I think these are really um, just, it's, it's not just about people moving around, but it's about people having safe places to, to live. Um, and so I think that that's, you know, we need to kind of be thinking about those together, certainly in the, um, you know, I live in a very increasingly unaffordable city where people are being pushed to the margins. So um, it's, it's not the, it's the, it's the opposite of what I, what I hope for, for, for my city and for the other cities in Canada. Thank you for that. Yeah, certainly. Mm -hmm. um, Safe spaces, both at home and while while we're traveling, are so so important. So thanks for that. Um, thanks for your time today. It's been super mm -hmm. helpful for us to to learn, to to hear your wisdom, and, and share your experience. And uh, I love the poster in the background. I'm going to work on my background next time, so I have some some bike related uh, gear in the back here. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah, we we so appreciate your time. One final question: I saw that you grew up in Southern Ontario. Where where did you grow up? In Oakville. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Um, the PTA has been home for a while, I guess. Yes. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Thanks so much. Any final words, Elise? Any? If anyone wants to um, read a little bit about bikes and economics, it's almost the same title. Ours is Bike Economics. This is Bike Economics um, from Ellie Blue and. Um, who knows, maybe she can be one of our next guests in a future episode. I'd love to talk about Ali and, uh, you know, like we touched on a lot of things, uh, bikes and business, uh, bikes and public space and equity, transportation and housing, great link there. Um, Nancy, there's so much more that we could talk about um, and how the cycling can have a positive impact in our economy. That, like we talk about, we could talk about the cost of public health, uh, the cost of road maintenance, the traffic collisions that could be reduced if you have more people cycling and uh, just so many other things. And of course, we just have 30 to 40 minutes to talk about this here, but uh, I, I'm hopeful and thank you so much for all your uh, your insights, Nancy. I'm hopeful we can further this conversation and we can have more people thinking about it and talking about it and being obsessed about it like you are, Nancy, about bikes in our cities. Thank you so much. Oh, we lost her, I guess. Well, yeah. um, that was another good show, Luis. Thanks so much for your help. And uh, and yeah, we'll let next week's episode will be about education, biking to, biking to school. Um, so look forward to that next Wednesday, June the 10th. And we're going to have some guests from, uh, from London at the school board and at the uh, Active and Safe Routes to School uh, join us. So look forward to that. And thanks for, for watching, everybody. Happy World Bicycle Day.